We got a bunch of products. We had a whole slew of products. Now we got the right number. We have a few that we can manage. And, and what I'm about to, to go over is uh, the results of the last month or so. We've been in and taken a lot of y'all's time, e even some of you newer folks. We've sat in, in fairly large meetings, not quite this large, but we've gathered a lot of uh, market intelligence. Uh, we, we've really taken a look at those sales cues, the orders cues, and really have a lot better understanding of what it, what it actually is the market's asking for us to make. And our response was, as this company grows at this huge inordinate rate, is to put enough kind of framework in place to make sure that we're really making the right product at the right time. So I'm the guy that's responsible for A, establishing that process, B, actually turning the crank and getting a product out. And now a product is everything from a streaming service to, say, any other product that's actually going to warrant some long-term customer care. Somebody that, that manifests themselves in our database, that's, that's a customer, that's a client. So my concern is uh, creating the right products at the right time. The first thing we discovered as we uh, drilled in a little bit, and I used an old technique known as workouts, we discovered that we were actually running this business in, in three separate kind of cyclic processes depicted up there in this picture. And if this looks kind of McKinsey-ish, it, it should. We, we had them draft these foils. But basically, there, there are three things we do. Starting on the, that, that right-hand white piece, we call that the, the business planning piece. I'm not going to read all the text for you. You can do that at some later point. But that's the spot where we go out to the market and, and, and take a look at what we want our, our value drivers to be. Those are the things that we as a business determine uh, we want to be measured out in the market by. And Jeff mentioned some, and, and, and Scott mentioned some others. Things like reach that John was talking about, we measure that. Things like revenue, we measure that. We measure a whole bunch of things. And as a concept gets, gets thrown out there, we're learning now to, to put it through an acid test, to basically do enough homework up front to see how important it is to us, how well it lines up with our strategic vision as that evolves, how well we can execute on it, and, and basically how good it is. Because, you know, there are a bunch of great ideas out there. Some of them are just not going to happen. We just don't, they just don't hit center of the fairway or they're just going to be something we can't turn out fast enough. So that first process is really owned by the, uh, the office of the chairman. That process is, is being partially implemented with uh, this concept of the war room that, that you may have heard about, but we got a little bit more homework there. I live in the development process. That's the one I care the most about, and you'll hear about here shortly. That's basically where we take concepts without necessarily a good, clear, cash flow pro forma view of the universe yet. We go out to the market, we get some real facts and figures as to what we should do when, and then we actually take the responsibility in that process step, looping around there, to execute. We actually then have to go strike the third party relationships or, or integrate the software and hardware and, and deploy the darn stuff internationally. So that's, that's, that's me in there. The last piece heading around the top, the top part of the cycle is, the customer life cycle. John Griebling now is responsible for that process, and, and that is everything from I've identified a customer, now go deploy that stuff there for that customer, on out to the care and feeding of that client in perpetuity. They live in a database, they need a customer call center response. Uh, they, they, he, he owns and runs the infrastructure, basically. So in a perfect world, those are three processes, they all run in parallel continuously, improving over time. That was the kind of the, the epiphany that uh, uh, senior management had here over the last month or so. But it's a nice framework to think in. Now let's, let's drill down into the development piece. What the development process really is, <clears throat> is, is just a way to guide the behavior of the different organizational pieces of ECI. Depicted here are, are only uh, one, two, three, four, five organizational boxes. We got Cox and Company up there in the upper left. We've got uh, Crowder and uh, and Jaeger up there on the on the right. We've got Broadband Product Solutions. Uh, that's me uh, in the middle. EIN Software Engineering. That's that's Rex and Company. 
And then over on the right, you got John Griebling. Now, just because your box isn't up there, don't fret. This is just a depiction of what the development process really is. It's really the relationships and, and the actions by which those boxes interact. And it goes something like this, if you can put a little mental animation to this. The broadband product solutions people basically intermediate or, or, or pass the market intelligence, what, what the salespeople need, what the actual client needs, and what our strategic relationships mandate. We basically pass those in the form of requirements, negotiated requirements, down to the EIN software engineering and network engineering folks. So uh, a, a classic example is, is what we're doing right now with uh, uh, some media cast server deployments as a good working example. We got to get to that 200,000 and even the 2 million number by the end of the year, number of streams. That's basically the, the market intelligence. Salespeople, the market at large has told us that. They basically said, don't care how you do it, just go make it happen. Here's the way the development process works today, and it's evolving. This is fine print so you all can't read it. That's the intention here. <laughs> but across the top, as far as I'm concerned, life consists of seven toll gates. That's it. Those are the little uh, uh, triangles down there. A toll gate is an event where the owners of that process actually have to endorse what was, what was reviewed at that session. So let's go through uh, the idea phase where uh, we do product and market assessment. The first box on the first blue box on the left. Idea comes in. We have to add a little value to that idea. Some of the deliverables and how we do that are in nine different categories to follow. Four of them are up here. As an example, to go to the first toll gate meeting, the following deliverables need to be in hand. We need uh, to measure the alignment with the corporate strategy. We need to look at a market size and share analysis. And we need to do a competitive advantage uh, description, not a full-blown full uh, strength, weakness, opportunity, threat matrix, but enough of a measure uh, to know what our competition would be in this space. That's all of uh, one sheet of paper, all right? And, and honestly, we're working on some templates to make this very simple. We believe that you all in the room, the business at large, as well as many of our strategic uh, third party and even vendors, are going to be coming at us with more and more product ideas that work well on our infrastructure and our business model. So we've got to make this easy. All right, from a financial instrument to, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a new form of interactive streaming video product. It's all going to pop through here in a half a day's time. We'll crank out the necessary analysis in, in the different areas, in the nine different areas, and we'll then have our first informal toll gate meeting where you basically have to get sign off from certain senior business people to advance to the next phase. The next phase is called business case development. This means, yeah, it's not a totally whacked idea. It's got some merit, and it looks like it's lined up pretty good. Now we go and we do some more homework. As identified in these, in these different fields here, you see we really blow out some of the marketing work. It's time to go get some real data. It's time to sit down and get some real voice of the customer. It's, it's time now to, to jump down in the, uh, in the resources side. Now we've got to go out and look at human capital issues. Can we even think about doing it internally, or is this really a... Uh, in equity, buy, is this an outsource thing? We've got to start thinking about how we can get to market quickly. All right? So without belaboring all the different toll gates, they're basically more and more refined, distinct, measurable deliverables in nine different categories as this process goes from toll gate one to toll gate seven. The way we're going to run product development my organization, is through each and every one of those toll gates, the team grows. All right? Initially, there's probably only one or two key advocates that are doing the real high-level analysis. In, in my lingo, that's a product manager and potentially a product marketing manager. We're not doing a lot of real work yet. We're turning a few spreadsheets. We're leveraging all that energy in the, in the war room. We're cranking out the analysis to tell us if this is a good market. As time goes on, if, in fact, we have to add human resources in the form of a, of a technical leader, in the form of a project manager, et cetera, et cetera, they get added at very clear points within the process. So it's, the, the, in an ideal world, a year from now, you should walk down the hallway and say, how's that project or product X going? Well, we just passed toll gate four. Everybody should know exactly what that means. Oh, yeah, I just finished toll gate three. 
You know, and it looks like my pro forma says we're going to be cash positive after a year. You know, we're all going to start thinking commercial, be it a streaming product or finance product. We're all going to know, we're all going to be able to navigate this, this diagram very quickly and very readily. All right. So think about advancing deliverables in nine different categories. Marketing, sourcing, financial, resources, technical, sales, service, and, and, and my last most uh, exciting one, risk. One of the things we discovered here is that each and every one of these products, financial, uh, tangible, moving bits or not, what, what we do best here at Enron, some, some would claim, is, is manage risk. Risk can be managed, technical risk even, can be managed just like any other risk. We've got to hedge, we've we got to make some bets, we've got to have alternatives, and we've got to have an abatement plan for everything. So that's the way I think. So if you ever hear anybody say, uh, my risk abatement plan has us uh, uh, you know, ramping risk to, a, to an acceptable level at time of launch, you, you'll know what that means. The day a product gets conceived, usually its risks are extremely high because there are a lot of unknowns. And I hate things like technical unknowns that require invention. I just hate them, okay? They need to be attacked early on so as, as a project advances, risk drops to a reasonable level and, and we go ahead and launch. So that, that's risk in, in context of uh, uh, development. What this will allow us to do is we'll post on hallways and in emails and on websites a measure of where we're at on a different product uh, per toll gate or sign-off point. And this, is, this shouldn't be taken away as, as necessarily the, the, the gospel uh, where all of our products are at this point. International's missing and there are a few others that are missing that are actually fairly advanced in any measure of toll gates. It's a fresh process. But if we took our best guess and said, OK, how mature is the media cast product? Well, we launched. We launched 1.0 in certain markets. Okay, so, it's, so it's cleared its seventh toll gate as of, as of the 20th, actually. All right, and, and going down the list, uh, stop to think about the fact that I'll, I'll, I'll bet there are uh, five or six products that aren't, aren't even up here that you all think you're working on right now. And that's a terrific thing. That's a great thing. We got all that energy. But at the same time, if it's not up here, or I didn't talk about it, there's a real issue because dollars to donuts, somebody like a John Griebling in the back end holding this whole thing together, plugging the dike, if you will, can't help you. Okay? They've got to be on the radar screen or you're going to wind up selling something that we can't support. All right? A little sobering thought there. So everything we do is going to be on a, uh, looks kind of like for the, for the rest of you from the rest of Enron, kind of a cross between a, a, a deal sheet and, uh, and a, uh, if you come from any product businesses, uh, thermometer charts or things of that sort. So it's kind of a hybrid that we, with the help of McKinsey, created just for this business. So you'll see those uh, hopefully showing up on hallways and, and, and websites soon that should tell you where the product's at. And just to, uh, to finish up, we're in the process of creating the ID assessment templates, and we want to make this so friggin' simple uh, uh, that, that, that it's easy. And it's easy to leverage all the analyst muscle we have in this company. It's one thing we have here that I've never seen another dot com that has. And, uh, and frankly, that's why I'm here rather than at a quest or anybody else like that. We can take, we, we have people from our other businesses that can run out and do the customer value proposition. They can do the competitive assessment. They can turn six, seven spreadsheets in, in two hours. And they can help us figure out how best to navigate our way into a new evolving market. So these things, with the help of uh, uh, Richard Reichert, who's just joined us in Houston, should be invaluable tools in this evolving concept of the war room. Fill these sheets out, get a little help from the analysts, we can take a look at it compared to all the other initiatives we, we want to mount. Okay? All right. So uh, uh, we've got a rough idea on who participates in the toll gate sign off processes, and, and that'll evolve with time. But a toll gate doesn't get passed unless you've actually, literally, got a sign off from somebody on a go no go to advance to the next toll gate. Sounds a little anal, but for those of you from EES over there uh, doing large power plant jobs or, or energy outsourcing jobs, boy, you got to have this. Uh, we got a lot of infrastructure with a lot of planning in some cases that takes a long time to, to, to queue up. 
So we're moving forward, we're making plans. Some names of some folks who are, uh, who are helping us flesh out all these different uh, 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 project areas. We've got a good mix of people ranging from uh, high-tech businesses like Tektronix to uh, process businesses like GE here, as well as a lot of Enron folks, and I think we're going to make some great progress. What we're going to segue to now, we're trying to really compress this thing, is we're now going to talk about the, uh, the marquee product. We're going to talk about status on a media cast product. Uh, we're then later this afternoon in a parallel track going to be able to dive down to a level of technical Q&A. We'll have the lead technical person on the telephone to answer the, the tough questions that, that either I or, or Kirk can't ask, uh, answer. But what, uh, uh, back to process for just a minute, Kirk is here to talk to you about it because Kirk is what we call a product manager for the MediaCast uh, product line. We have currently, uh, what, four product managers uh, and a lot more products than product managers. We got Kirk on MediaCast. We have John Svetko on Media Transport. Yes, it's still alive and well. Uh, it, uh, it went away for a brief hiatus while we fixed uh, some serious market slash technology problems. We'll talk more about that later in the day. Uh, we've got video conferencing that's even, even more nascent. It's, it's still somewhat in a business development uh, uh, status with uh, Gary Waxman uh, at the helm there. And we've now just developed uh, at least two other product offerings that are being run through the concept phase. Currently, Richard Reichert is, uh, w with the help of, a, of a Gary Egan, is taking a look at two areas. One is value-added services on top of MediaCast, and we'll talk more about that later today. Uh, and the other is our event services. We've identified a, a serious opportunity and responsibility, frankly, uh, to leverage what MediaCast can do for us uh, uh, for mobile and, and transient events. So we're working out the economics on that and, and think we'll beat a market with something very quickly. So it's kind of like a back of the envelope where we're at, at least on the top four or five initiatives. I don't want to leave out Steve's International. We're working it, Steve. We'll, 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 we'll talk more about it shortly. But, uh, Kurt. want to go through kind of what the basics are because I know there's a lot of new people. So, um, you know, at a very uh, high level, what, what MediaCast is, how the Internet works. So just a, a quick briefing on the way data is uh, transmitted across the Internet, why that doesn't work for video and video streaming, and why MediaCast then offers a much better value proposition than delivering it over the uh, public Internet. Uh, then we're going to dive into the product details, so the roadmap of where we're going with the product as far as stream capacity, uh, ingress and egress options, uh, what's new about the product, so new technologies and new features. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about caching so that you can understand what that technology is and how we're implementing that in a different manner than what's uh, previously been available. Um, talk about multicast uh, and that technology and how it applies to doing live events and offering better service through our network. Uh, we're going to go over pricing and customer trials and billing. There's actually a separate track tomorrow which is going to go into the details of the billing system. Uh, so this is going to be more around uh, what the price model is, what the drivers are, what you want to be looking for uh, in using the pricing. And then uh, if we uh, have some time, really get some uh, discussion going about future features. Um, obviously, I'm going to be available for, for questions that we don't answer, and we have the technical track this afternoon. So when we, when we talk about MediaCast, what are we saying? The, well, if we look at kind of the, the top three things that, that people typically respond, they say, Enron's trying to do video over the Internet the way it was really meant to be, so doing TV quality broadcast video. Um, bringing this broadcast video, what that really means is that you don't have the buffering, you don't have the herky-jerky video experience that people typically have looked at uh, when they've tried to do streaming video today over the Internet. And when we really kind of throw in the details behind it, you know, by combining our fiber and satellite network with distributed server architecture, that's what creates this premium platform for delivering video. And in order to really kind of understand why that's significant, we need to, to step back and look at what the Internet is and, and how it's uh, been delivering data and video. So I've got some, some basics as far as definition goes. Um, 
But the, the internet really is a network of networks. It's been around for a long time, was started in the, in the 60s as a mechanism for the Defense Department to make sure that messages and data were available to different mission critical uh, points across the country. Uh, the World Wide Web is a subset of the internet. It's the most common uh, method of getting to that data today because we have browser technology like Netscape and Internet Explorer. Uh, but it's, it's uh, just a piece of, of the data that's out there traveling on the internet. We look at web hosting companies. These are really uh, people that are running servers that are, that are set up to host the data on the web page so that the, the enterprise or the organization doesn't have to run that in-house. Um, these people are now getting into streaming and hosting streaming as well, and that's where our service comes into play. Uh, John McLean talked a little bit about internet access and service providers. There's a lot of people out there uh, providing access, providing networks. All that fits together in delivering the internet and delivering those data packets. And then TCP IP, that's really the, the two uh, standards by which data travels. And we're going to jump into a little bit of detail. But if we look at the architecture behind the internet, if you look at this foil and see how complicated and complex and woven together things are, it really shows you how messy the internet is today. Uh, because it was originally designed for redundancy, there were lots of ways of getting the data there. And they set up the protocols so that the data could be broken into packets and could travel over multiple networks, but it was guaranteed to get there. And that data would then get reformulated back together so that the message would get there in one piece. When you look at that as far as doing video, you know, with text, it, it's not as important the order that those packets show up so that you can actually read that, that message. But when you get into video images and video streaming, it's very critical that those pieces all line up and come at the same time so that you can actually watch the video as one piece. And that's where uh, all of these arrangements of the multiple networks make it too complex and too uh, congested today with all the data that's out there to really deliver a high quality. When we look at TCP IP technology, uh, from an engineering level, typically you break things into uh, a stack, where at the bottom level you have the physical and data layer. This is really where the, the hardware is, the, the actual physical wire. Uh, at the top level you have the application. So this is uh, like your web browser and actually um, the, the real networks application, the Windows Media application. In the middle there, you have the, the network layer, which is really where internet protocol comes into play, IP. Um, this is what addresses the packets and tells the information uh, how it can be routed through the network. On top of that, you have the transport protocol, which is where uh, TCP, transmission control protocol, actually goes in. After those packets have been addressed, it breaks them apart and, and sends them out. It's also the protocol that reassembles them and puts them back into order. Um, the protocol really is uh, a connectionless protocol, which means that, that when you have TCP IP working together, each of the packets could travel over different networks around the Internet uh, and actually get to the same spot. But they travel through different access points, multiple networks, multiple hops to actually get there. So when you look at how somebody's actually uh, making requests and receiving those. You may have an end user sitting in Oklahoma that makes a request for a web page that's hosted in Seattle. Um, their ISP may be on network number three. They have a peering arrangement with network number four, and so the request would go through network four. The actual web page is hosted on network number one. It responds and sends the data back. Well, this time, network four is a little bit more congested, so that data actually is going to travel through network two and then deliver to network three. So as you can see, there's lots of hops, what we call hops, of jumping around the internet to deliver those packets and get that data back and forth across the, the public internet. Um, when John was going through who some of the, the different uh, providers and carriers are, um, all of those people are, are working through either developing their own networks or getting on the, the internet through major network access points. 
And as the internet was started, the, this was a, a pretty simple way to get people on and off the network and get them connected and talking to, together. It was never planned for this much data to be traveling over the network as it was originally constructed. You have the official network access points. There were uh, four of them that, that were uh, brought online. Uh, you have the metropolitan area ethernets, uh, six major ones of those. Um, and then you have the, the, the federal internet exchanges and the commercial internet exchanges, which provide other places for commercial and government users to get online and transfer data. Uh, because there have been, uh, like I said, the, the original intention was to simplify it and make it easy to get on the network. Uh, what that's done as the internet has grown and as the World Wide Web has taken off, it's actually created choke points within the internet that all of this data has to travel through certain points within the country and get exchanged to get from network to network. So uh, I'm going to, we kind of talked about this, but when, when you have somebody going to say the Amazon.com website, you know, potentially if they were on MindSpring as their, their ISP, uh, MindSpring would then have an arrangement with GTE to provide the backbone uh, service, so actually get them onto the internet. MindSpring has its own uh, little network. GTE provides them with getting on the backbone of the, the actual internet. Then GTE has, an, uh, has to go through the Chicago network access point that Ameritech runs um, to actually get to the web host that's handling Amazon's site. So as you can see, there, there's a lot of places where data has to traffic. Uh, to get around to actually get that request and respond back. When we talk about a network of networks, um, it's probably a little bit hard to see, but what, this is a list of the major networks that are connected together and network providers that are connected together to make up the Internet. And the, the data that's in this graph is really a, um, a weighted average of the download times uh, provided by each of these network providers. So you can see as you're hopping across multiple networks and combining uh, the latency that, that's built into each of these networks, you can get uh, a, a large variability on the quality of the service that's going to be provided in delivering that data to the end user. And it gets very complex quickly. So Kirk, if we were up there on that picture, this would be a serious sales tool. Definitely. I mean, the, the speed of our network and the capability to, to do a one-hop delivery of applications, whether it's streaming or not, is a, a huge differentiator and, and would put us at the, at the forefront of some of these network providers. So when you, you think about streaming media, um, the, the real problem is that the stream packets hop across all the multiple networks, and each of these hops um, Data is actually, the, the router is having to decide which packet's going to go through that connection point uh, and, and deciding on the ordering, which with, with other types of data, it's not as critical what the order is. With video, you get very poor quality of streaming by having, not having all those packets show up at the same time and, and forcing you to buffer and get, get a jittery experience as you go through it. When you look at MediaCast, what we bring to the table by having the EIN is the content provider can put content on the network. We have distributed servers connected to the network that are in our e-powered ISPs, as well as some of our third-party uh, wide area network providers, InterNAP and Level 3, that allow us to deliver video in a much better performance. So when you have a request coming in from a user who's connected to an e-powered ISP, for on-demand content, that content's sitting in the streaming server so that it's one hop away from the end user. There's no traversing over the public internet. There's no other hops other than the request directly to that e-powered ISP. When we have somebody coming in not through an e-powered ISP, we picked out the partners InterNAP and Level 3 because they're network providers to other ISPs. They have their own wide area network that's set up in a way that it, it avoids the choke points of the public internet and although you have to traverse the internet to a certain regard and you get a couple hops along the way, it's much shorter than having that stream hosted out on the public internet and provides them with a, a what we call a tiered quality of service that's not quite as good as being connected to an e-powered ISP, but it's much better than being delivered through the public internet. 
Hey, Kirk, before, before you go to the next one, talk to some numbers here. I mean, these folks over there at Shepherd saw a lot of servers getting racked up. What's going where? So um, with, with InterNAP and Level 3, what we're doing, um, and I'm actually going to talk about the strategy behind it, as John and Matt and April have talked about, we've, we've been in this chicken and egg situation where the content providers want to make sure that we have uh, stream capacity before they sign up. The ISPs don't want to let us into their pops until we actually have content. So one of the things we've done in partnering with InterNAP and Level 3 is we're actually going out and putting lots and lots of servers in the InterNAP sites where we're already connected so that we will actually have 100,000 simultaneous stream capacity simply through our InterNAP, IS, InterNAP POP locations. Uh, so predominantly in LA and New York, uh, we're ramping up those servers. Um, actually last night I was uh, pleasantly surprised that, that all the servers were out of there. I also was a little bit worried when we had the football toss right next to a whole rack of servers that I know are getting ready to get shipped out. But um, that's the, all that equipment is going in so that we get the stream capacity up and can actually provide the content providers with, with the capacity that's needed as we then go in and pick out the, the right e-powered ISP pops so that we can have those direct connections. In the future, one of the things that we're going to be doing, as John mentioned earlier, uh, we're actually going to be e-powering uh, ISPs that are not connected directly to the EIN. So we'll go in and put in a streaming server, which for on-demand content, that content can be cached there and give the end user a one-hop experience. For live uh, type of feeds and, and special events, that ISP won't be able to deliver uh, a quality that's better, any better than what's on the internet today, but it will give them the benefit of being able to deliver on-demand content uh, in the, the e-powered experience. Can you differentiate that somehow? Well, actually, that's kind of a, the segue into here. Um, it, it really allows us to, to differentiate ourselves through a tiered quality of service, and so we can talk to content providers um, and really offer them different models depending on you know, what type of access they feel their end users want and they need. Um, that also allows John a, a way to differentiate the business models that he sets up with the ISPs uh, as far as whether it's a revenue share or swap or that we don't give them anything other than free equipment. But when we look at uh, kind of a graph of the hop count for, for the end user being on the x-axis and the y-axis being network congestion, you know, way out on, on the right as far as poor quality is the standard portal today that's hosting the content themselves right there with their, their uh, other web content. Uh, you have other providers which get a little bit closer in uh, by using centralized servers in different locations across the internet. Then where the sweet spot starts with MediaCast as we start to uh, do the new deployment of, of ISPs that aren't uh, connected directly to the EIN, they can start to give a better experience with that one hop model. Then we, we get into the delivery through InterNAP and Level 3, which is the next level of quality better. Uh, it's better than the internet experience. And then lastly is the true e-powered ISP, the one hop model. The eyeballs are directly connected to our network and can give a great experience for video. Um, so I've talked about kind of how how the data is transferred. When we think about content viewing, uh, a lot of people ask, well, how does it really know whether you're coming in through an e-powered ISP or not? Well, the, the process for actually viewing the content, when you're looking at your browser and you're out at Den's website and you click on that link for the real uh, video content, what, what's actually happening is that you're going to their uh, web server, which has the, the actual HTML content, and there's a link there that, that redirects them to our network. And when, when the person has clicked on that, that redirection gives us their IP address. Our e-powered ISPs give us their table of IP addresses. So all of their end users, when you dial up, um, you don't see this happening, but you're assigned an IP address. Uh, the ISPs give us that range of addresses that they have. We do a quick lookup of that request to see whether we know that IP address in our database, 
And when we see that IP address, we know exactly which ISP pop that request is coming from, and we direct the, the stream request to the server sitting in the e-powered ISP, so that then it's just delivered right over their dial-up connection, either DSL or dial-up or what have you. That's really how the content uh, and how the application, how MediaCast works in order to tell whether somebody's coming in through an e-powered ISP or not. Um, John talked about the reach. Um, just want to point out that, you know, when we show this, what we're, when, you, when you go out and talk to people about this, one of the things you want to point out is that these are our city pop locations, and we connect to the ISP directly from these city pops, either through a DS3 connection or uh, we'll be bringing up satellite delivery. So that's really how the, the reach is extended to the end user is through those ISPs that we're bringing online. Uh, John talked about our distribution alliances. We have 20 uh, today. There's a bunch that are getting ready to be announced and, and getting signed. What that really represents is the, the capability to bring up over 500 POP facilities, which means that we'll be able to have uh, you know, directly accessing the network over 24 million desktops. So those users are all capable of getting an e-powered experience once those pops are brought up and, and we, as we move forward, that's how we differentiate this delivery platform. In November, we did the, the Drew Carey event. This was the largest webcast ever done over the public internet. It was a combination of multiple providers, um, we worked with ABC and, and Warner Brothers and Disney, um, as well as a lot of our competitors. We, we actually aggregated our, uh, our stream capacity with the likes of Akamai and Sandpiper and iBeam. Uh, all of our competitors worked together to actually pull off the largest web event. Uh, this was very significant for us. It was also the first time that we did any Windows Media Player uh, streaming over the web. Uh, the sales guys talked about the content deals. Um, this is really great. You guys have pulled off a, a lot of success here in getting content. Uh, this is really going to help the, the distribution team as far as being able to promote it. It's also going to get us recognized in the market as uh, we go out and promote the fact that we have some of these customers. Now we're going to jump into the, the roadmap update. So what I've got here, it's a bit of an eye chart, but this is really our feature roadmap. Uh, we're going to be sending this out uh, with periodic updates to this. This is really your reference chart, kind of your card to post in your cube of, of where we are, what our capacity is going to be, what we can sell at what times. And I'm going to go through each of these in detail. Right now, uh, on the initial release, uh, we're bringing up and, and like I said, I was glad to see that those servers had, had shipped out of the Shepherd facility already. So that we'll get the 100,000 stream capacity for, for uh, Real Networks G2. We have uh, 10,000 stream capacity on the Windows Media Player. We're calling that beta right now because as we bring the log processing online uh, in order to do usage reports, um, right now that's a pretty, pretty handheld process. So. Uh, uh, we're still kind of calling that beta as we, we really uh, transition and bring up the, the billing and extranet system. Um, when we look at capacity, we're growing this out so that by the end of the year, we'll have the capacity to do a million simultaneous users. When we talk about stream capacity, we're, we're, the reference model in the industry is a 20K stream. That's really the smallest stream size available. That's not our sweet spot, but that, that's become the industry standard in how to refer to your, your stream capacity. Um, uh, as we go forward, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll have a million simultaneous stream capacity. That means that, that as we have tons and tons of content providers with content on the network, we can handle that many requests at one time and be able to deliver that many streams at one time. Uh, so a million concurrent requests can come in, you know, within a minute or so, and we can start all of those at the same time. Kirk, we're still on target for a million and a million. By, right. by the end of 2000. Right. Of both G2 and Windows Media. Mm -hmm. These are the latest updated numbers. Uh, it's actually a, a little bit down from what we had said previously, uh, but again, as we're getting into the implementation of this, we're getting a, a better definition of how quickly we can bring these things up. 
We will be adding QuickTime support. Uh, we're working with Sun Microsystems on a, a QuickTime streaming solution, uh, which we'll be bringing online in the, the first quarter and, and start to uh, really offer that at, in the second quarter. Uh, we may work with some of your customers on some beta uh, arrangements on QuickTime in the first quarter. Talking about getting to capacity, as we mentioned, we've been in this chicken and egg situation about needing capacity uh, before we can get a content deal, but needing a content deal before we can actually get the, the opportunity in the pops. The short term is working with InterNAP. Um, and bringing up the capacity there. We're also starting to work with level three and bring up the capacity in their sites as well. So the stream capacities you'll notice increase pretty quickly and that, that's really how we're getting those numbers up. We're putting large amounts of streaming servers in uh, particular pop sites. Again, the long-term strategy and where we benefit the most is being able to differentiate ourselves by having lots of e-powered ISPs, so lots of eyeballs directly connected to the network. So the quality of the videos there, the quality of the other applications that we deliver will be available one hop from the end user. Um, in the streaming server strategy, as far as what we're putting in those POP facilities, Previously, we had one uh, equipment design. We, we kind of did a one-size-fits-all. Uh, we jammed it into the rack space. If you're not familiar with server technology, um, a rack is a, kind of like a tall cabinet um, where the, the servers actually fit. There's a limited amount of space. Floor space is very critical at an ISP. Uh, that, that's at a premium. They don't have a lot of room for a lot of servers. So we have to be much more economical about the amount of space we ask for. That's why as we're moving forward, we're actually coming up with four or five different designs that are much more suited around uh, what the ISP environment looks like. So how many end users they have connected, if it's an enterprise, looking at what, uh, how many users they have at the particular enterprise and sizing that equipment to fit with what their needs really are. This is much more capital efficient for us. Uh, we are using very premium equipment even as we go to the multiple designs, we're, we're at kind of the bleeding edge of the technology. Um, that's great because we're getting a lot better performance than, uh, than what our competitors do. Um, the downside to that is that sometimes you get into issues on implementation and actually getting that equipment as, as soon as it was originally committed. Let, uh, let, me, let me throw a couple of things in. Where's John McLean? We doing the right thing here, John? Yes. Is this cool or what, huh? You guys ask for it, you get it, right? This is going to happen. I mean, <laughs> consider, consider another thing. From a value sale point of view, there you go, I like that. From a value point of view, we manage these boxes. Our competition doesn't. These are platinum stainless steel boxes that are bulletproof. From a tel we think telco mentality with all those nines. That's what we do. That's not what our competition does. These are very carefully engineered racks full of gear that sits there with little SNMP lights going on and off back at the uh, network operations center. So consider that when we propose this many different boxes, we're in the process of designing, these are all still very carefully managed boxes. But now we've got a way to go after these guys that are eating our lunch on the low end tier, these guys that are dropping off these $1,000 Linux boxes and eroding our market share with, with bullshit market figures. We're going to go after them with a box that's manageable, that really works. All right, so there's a couple value plays in there. We're going to go after the guys that are coming in underneath us with the big numbers, but we still manage the infrastructure. So when they get caching, we got caching. So we're, 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 we're going to be at least on parity, if not above. So this is, this is pretty key. Well, the answer for that is we're working with, uh, with our caching vendor right now, and we're kind of caught up in some intellectual, intellectual property issues on, on getting the caching to actually work. When the caching works, and Kirk will talk about dates when it's actually the full hierarchical caching <laughs> is done, when, when the caching is all, all actually up and done, the playing field really changes because now all we need is like two streaming servers, or three, one for Windows Media, one for uh, uh, QuickTime, and one for G2, somewhere in the cloud. It's obviously we'll have a few more than that, but in the limiting case, we move to full hierarchical caching at the edges. We actually don't run 
a video server, a streaming server on, on the edge box anymore. Linux support all three of those? You know, there's another meeting down the hall there, uh, David. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Lin li Linux does. Linux does. Just a detail, right? <laughs> Actually, the media player is still, Microsoft's pretty, pretty tight on keeping media players stuck to NT. So you, you get to have an NT box somewhere until, uh, until somebody figures out a little bit different way to deploy it. That, that's actually something that, that the distribution team has to, to really be focused on as they're signing up an ISP and making sure that they qualify that ISP and go through with them the levels of service that we expect from them as well as the levels of service that we're going to be able to provide. You're, Now you're actually taking on one video. Right. And from their standpoint, as far as benchmarking their networks, they didn't benchmark their networks for video. They benchmarked their, their networks for data. How do we protect and actually send them to the correct way to know how to actually understand what their volume market is? Because in the long run, it doesn't matter if you hear that you got a pop that has 500 power routers, if you got 500 very small routers, right? Well, let, yeah, let, let, me, let me get anecdotal here, Doug, because we're I, I know exactly where you're going. We we've we've got a couple of pockets of data. One is GeoQual and, <laughs> and all the stuff that's going on there. We got a rough idea in there of who oversubscribes and how, but it's it's not perfect. When we started down the internet and level three road, we, we realized there actually is a whole bunch of other ways that we can measure and back ourselves in into the right answer. One of them is we're actually doing some engineering design now, looking at level three and saying, how many AOL dial-up ports? Did you know for the Drew Carey thing, 20% of our action came from AOL alone. Well, you know what? Now we're looking at them as a credible distribution partner, if you will. We're actually counting modem banks. And we're saying, geez, can they do it? If we put 100,000 streams in level three, which we're doing, where, where the, how are they going to egress, right? So we're doing that counting and management now. We, we hope to have it kind of in a database, so when you all create a lead, if you will, you already <laughs> know what their infrastructure can do and can't do. In an ideal world, I'll go so far as to say a year from now, they will have contractual commitments back to us for, for guaranteeing that last leg of delivery. And a year after that, NPLS is real, and it's a done deal, right? But I'm not holding my breath for that. Yes. We we started. I mean, you're hitting a really key point because one of the if we got value propositions, they probably really fall in three areas on this product. One is that we manage that endpoint, okay? The, the, the other is that we're going to provide tiers across the whole band. But the third would be that we would claim we're doing surgical deployment. We can't do that surgical deployment unless we go and make a bunch of measurements and we actually know. So there's work happening as we speak. We're leveraging all the data we gathered from these events and everything that the media cast servers have gathered. And we actually have people pawing through the logs to see where the IP addresses came from, i.e., who should we be going after domain-wise, you know? Uh, and, and that's where this AOL data comes up recently. Number two, we can also tell by looking at that session what kind of quality that ISP's infrastructure could carry. And you know what? There's some bad boys out there in terms of dropped streams. There's some people we just plain want to avoid, okay? And it's starting to correlate fairly well with the measurements that... Uh, uh, that uh, Broad, uh, what, what's the name of Board the? Boardwatch. Boardwatch and some of the other guys make. So there, there are people out there were leveraging some data that uh, the Boardwatch stuff Kirk showed was primarily uh, bulk FTP and, and HTML transfers. It's not quite what we're looking for. Murad is in the process of going and dealing back with them and helping them set up another index 
so we can actually get on a different chart and, and win at that one. But it's data analysis because, you know, we plan to deploy a lot and spend a lot of Jeff's money like he was talking this morning. We certainly plan to do that. But we want to do it in the right markets, in the right place, with the right players. So, you know, if you've got great ideas in this arena, have at it. Uh, help us. Matt. We 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 can talk about today, and and we can scale it back linearly. Uh, do, where are we at with uh, with E? Um, well, the the actual servers that we're using in each one are the same. We've actually worked with Sun and uh, are getting their streamlined server. It's actually one U, uh, which allows us to scale pretty easily. Um, you know, on the on the basic level, the A design, which is going to be one server, one storage appliance, and a router. Um, you're looking at somewhere between. 75 to 100k. I, I don't know the exact cost of goods numbers, and then it scales as, as we go up. Um, you know, uh, the, this equipment is the premium equipment that's out there, uh, and that's why we're trying to, to make it a more scalable uh, model. Brother, what would an Akamai server cost? Five thousand. The, the server, the server to server comparison, cost-wise, is probably yeah around eight, probably eight thousand for what they're doing, eight to twelve. And the server that we're buying is around 20. But performance is totally different as far as those two servers are compared. The sign that we have going into POPs today is a quarter of a million dollars, which includes yeah, for, the, bit, the, the, the switch. The one size fits all. It's a quarter of a million up. dollars. So, Matt, it doesn't take a, you know, a brain surgeon to just turn some mental math and say it a nickel a megabyte or whatever, man, we got a long way to go. That's not the only plan. All right. Suffice it to say, there's a lot of available MIPS and infrastructure there, and, and I leave everybody in the room to create that next big business plan that leverages all that infrastructure. So uh, let's keep moving because uh, we are a little behind schedule. The Ingress solutions that we have today, this is the way that people can actually get content on our network. Uh, for the, the customers that are putting on-demand content, we set up a FTP, a file transfer protocol account, uh, so they actually use the internet. To, to move that content onto our network uh, where we then replicate it and push it out. The content providers can also be connected uh, via uh, dedicated circuits, so a DS3 or a T1, uh, or they may happen to be co-located in, uh, in the same facility as where our Enron pop is. And in those cases, it's really simple. It's a fast Ethernet connection. Um, this allows them with these direct circuits, either the DS3, the T1, or the fast Ethernet, to be able to ingress uh, any kind of live type of content that they want to do. Jeff? Yeah, involved in T1 ingress, I think your answer's on the roadmap. If if you went back several pages, you'd see that uh, when when are we going to have an answer there? Well, I mean, the answer that for somebody like a 28k, the answer for them is is when we have access via a slower method. They obviously aren't going to consume a T1. Uh, they obviously would be looking for something like internet. It is the only option we give them. It, it, Yeah, as we move forward, we'll, we'll have a lot more of the POP facilities set up for the different ingress methods. And that's also, when we, when we look at futures, uh, we're in the process of, of working out a plan so that we can take ISDN ingress, that we can take satellite as a downlink mechanism for live content, and even ingress through internet. Um, and John may touch on, as we're... Uh, as we're looking at events as a, as a separate category or a separate type of product, uh, we're either going to do some of the, we, we probably will end up mixing some of these where we'll do some of them ourselves and deploy the equipment that, that gives us this capability ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be looking at 
uh, specific partners that we can work with who will have the, the T1 ingress already, that they, they will aggregate the ISDN and the low bit rate type of ingress methods so that we don't have to spend additional capital in order to get uh, kind of the, the low, low bandwidth type of content. When we look at egress, so the way that those streams actually get delivered, um, we have fast Ethernet for ISPs that are co-located in the same facility. Uh, right now, when we pull up, uh, bring up an e-powered ISP, we're actually provisioning a DS3 from our POP facility to the, the ISP POP and then co-locating that equipment and bringing it up online. Um, that's when, when John was talking about we brought 40-some ISP POPs online. Uh, that's what goes into the process, and that's what, what's kind of the time-consuming part of that process is getting that dedicated circuit. Right now, uh, that time frame can be anywhere from 45 to as much as 60, 70 days to actually get that dedicated circuit. So uh, there's a lot of time involved in bringing up the, those e-powered ISPs. That also is part of the reason as we look at ISPs that aren't going to be connected to our network, we can bring those pops up much quicker just by deploying those servers and, and routers and, and getting them uh, online in, in a much quicker fashion. Uh, lastly, as far as futures, we're looking at satellite downlink. We've already been beta testing this within some of our Enron pop facilities. So this is a, a mechanism for us to use satellite to extend our reach and get it out there quicker. There's been some legal issues around this that, that have kind of slowed the deployment of this, getting roof rights and having, it's actually a lot more complex because you have to go in and deal with the county and city uh, legal departments uh, to, to make sure that all the permits and all of those type of things are, are actually taken uh, into consideration. Um, so what's new? What, you know, we talked about stream capacity, and we, we all know that we can actually deliver a, a G2 and a media player stream. What's some of the underlying technologies that are changing uh, to improve the service as we go forward? One of the things that we're in the process of, of doing is our universal content locator. Um, right now, when you do a, a Real Networks G2 stream or a Windows media player stream, each of those server applications have their own mechanism uh, that you use in order to connect multiple servers together. So when you look at a network of G2 servers uh, that are out there, uh, they have their own technology for allowing you to connect those servers to together and be able to route stream requests across that network. That technology is different than what Microsoft uses for Windows Media Player and different from what Apple uses for QuickTime. We've been actually, Enron's actually been writing software that allows us to do that content location request uh, universally so that it's format agnostic. Um, we're, we're in the process of bringing this up. The software will be up in Q1. Uh, we're running into a few snags, but uh, overall the, the development's gone pretty well. Uh, and we're in the testing phase and, and really in the scalability part of the, that testing. Uh, Universal Log Processor is another piece of software that Enron's actually been writing. Each of these streaming servers that we have out there, and, and as John talked about, we're going to have 3,500 of these servers out there by the end of this year. Each one of those servers creates a log of each request. So when you've watched a video, what's actually happening is that, that there's a log being generated that has your IP address what time you started that stream, what time you ended that stream, what the average bit rate that was that was delivered. All of the information that we gather that, that that log creates is what goes into the usage reports and provides valuable data to the content provider around the characteristics of who's watching it and, and what, uh, what type of stream they're looking at and where they're coming from. Uh, each, as I said, each server software application, so Real Networks or Windows Media, uh, has their own different log format. We're writing this piece of software that enables us to be able to pull those servers on an hourly basis, pull those log files so that then as the extranet gets deployed, our content providers can actually go in and get the information about their content, who's watching it and what's being consumed uh, on an hourly, daily, weekly basis. Um, it's going to be included in their bills at the end of the month, a, a monthly summary of that data. 
This is a piece of software that, that we've written ourselves and we're actually in the process of doing the testing and deploying deployment and be bringing that online with the extranet. Um, ink to me caching. Uh, ink to me is really the, the carrier class leader in caching software. Um, caching is, is really the, the technology that allows you to temporarily store data on a server on a requested basis. Um, it typically has been uh, deployed previously up until a few months ago just for um, HTML and other types of, of formats that hasn't been used for video previously until ink to me just recently re released uh, a version that added streaming to that capability. So it allows uh, once one user has actually made a request, there's content cached there. We're working very closely with ink to me on actually changing that software so that it can work within a hierarchical network. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. Multicast. Multicast is a technology that allows us to be able to scale the number of live events that we can handle over our network. It helps us manage our bandwidth and not consume as much bandwidth for stream requests over the network for live events. And I'll, I'll kind of go into to what the difference is between multicast and, and what we do today, uh, what most people do today, which is unicast. Um, I'm going to look at caching first. <laughs> yeah, um, the workaround on the universal content locator, until we get that software in place, we're using the technologies that the server application comes with. So on real networks, we're using uh, their technology, which is called FindSplitter, which allows us to put in the server addresses into a file so that when the request comes in, uh, it will actually do the lookup of the IP address and do some of the routing. Under we Windows Media Technologies, uh, we use what's called an ASX file. Um, this is how we did the Drew Carey event. Um, it, again, allows us to put in uh, the locations, the addresses of all of our servers so that it can then route to those servers. Um, Are there any limitations there that we should be aware of the cellular ability? Um, not, on, not on the content location. Uh, the, you know, these pieces right here are really the back end that allows us to scale. Um, they're not as much a selling point as it is how the technology works and how we're able to scale this up and, and do more things. Um, so the, the difference to the content provider on Universal Content Locator is the way the, the actual URL is written that they put into their web page. So until we get content, the Universal Content Locator up, there's going to be two different strings that they have to write as the actual link. When we get Universal Content Locator in place, it'll be the same nomenclature, you know, independent of what type of format they're using. No, there, there's there's actually no one in the software market that's delivering this this capability. We could not buy this off the shelf. So Actimai doesn't have it or Sandpiper. No, no, and that. iBeam has a, a a product called iDirector, which does allow you to add servers in and and allow them to transfer requests, um, which is kind of similar to this, um, but it, it's not as robust. We actually found during the Drew Carey event we were testing using iBeam's iDirector and they couldn't handle, they couldn't manage the requests in a way that would that would actually distribute it evenly across the, the different networks. So it, it is a differentiator as far as a capability that other folks don't have, but I don't necessarily see it as a selling point until you get to that IT director that you need to talk to about the nuts and bolts. Uh, Jeff. Um, it, it, it would, as far as um, when we actually start hooking up enterprises and hand off a multicast stream, um, then those enterprises, uh, we would actually not have as much data about once that stream's fed into the enterprise, how many people are actually watching it in that enterprise. So that would that would be one ramification, but that whether it's the universal log processor or the current logging technologies that are built into the server app, 
you, you run into the same same type of problem because it is a multicast handoff. Well, what to point of clarification, what we have to what what he's going to talk about is server to server <laughs> multicast distribution right. as opposed to client side. Your point's well taken on a client side as people uh, uh, join and leave multicast groups. Uh, I don't know that we fully investigated, at least on the, on the uh, Windows side, how that actually manifests itself in a file. We'll have to find out, because that's usually done by a router, not, not done by the server. So that information may be lost. What about the effects on the bottom line, the actual dollars? The, the bottom line part, it, it won't have as, as much of an effect, uh, because we're, we're still going to be able to, to track the, the traffic that's, that's being handed off at that server at the ISP. But not to individual Not to the, if, if we hand off a multicast stream to an enterprise, not to the individual users. And typically, that's why we're looking at events as a separate entity. Events typically, which is where multicast would come into play, uh, a live event is typically going to be priced with some event pricing built into that and not just our standard pricing model. And I'll, I'll talk about pricing in a minute. Doug's had his hand up. Last question for you, Kurt. Scalability. You mentioned scalability in the form and the fact that we're putting universal content located in places are to actually serve three different languages as far as three different servers to our actual content. But in that particular case, that's only really, if you think about it, 30 percent of what the content located does. It actually beats the actual clients, the actual stream capacity. Where are we going and where are we as far as being able to dynamically look at and also allocate announced routes from each one of our ISP partners through that content located? So that this is no longer a static or a high administration type of actual process, which of course is totally against scalability. You're talking about the downstream request from the ISP.